President staff to present things when they go to meetings. This particular meeting is uh, is 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 a little different, and uh, and Jacob and Tyler will tell you about it. But uh, I was up there a couple of years ago to actually give a talk at this meeting, and wasn't even really aware that the college sponsored it. But it's another example of what the American College of Surgeons tries to do for all of us. Uh, interestingly, I met with the medical students yesterday, and we had a good bit of discussion about residents as teachers and how important that is. And it's one of the things that's been a hallmark of our program here and something we're particularly proud of is that our residents uh, do a really good job as teachers, at least as uh, expressed by the opinions of the medical students who are here. Uh, we use them as, as the evaluation tool. Um, and that's been that way for a long time. And of course, as most of you know, I don't think you really know something unless you can teach it to somebody else or show them or try to explain it at the very least. And so it's really a benefit to you as well as them. So this was a particularly well-organized course, at, uh, at least the time that I was there. It was also ironic. I don't know who was the lead instructor this time, but to meet with this particular individual one-on-one, -on -one, he was as dull as about anybody you could talk to. But when he got on that stage, it was really amazing to me. So it shows you the different personality changes that people can do if they set their mind to do it. So anyway, look forward to this review, guys. Thanks, Dr. Burns. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Giles, too, uh, for um, picking us to, to go on this trip. We had a good time. So um, as Dr. Burns said, this was uh, ACS sponsor course. This is residents as uh, teachers and leaders. Um, uh, we have no disclosures. Um, so this course was in uh, Illinois, uh, in Chicago, in 2017 in April. This is kind of the poster for the course. The overview is a three-day course uh, sponsored by the American College of Surgeons. Uh, it had two main goals. One was to help uh, residents develop uh, some of the essential non-clinical skills uh, that would be crucial to success as a teacher and a leader and to address the skills uh, necessary to become more effective in teaching and leading. This is the uh, course outline, uh, maybe kind of hard to see up there, but there's uh, several different topics that we went through uh, over the three days. Uh, th through this lecture, we'll kind of give you a brief overview of the ones that we felt were most pertinent and, uh, and helpful to us. So we flew out on a, a Thursday. We had a beautiful view of Chattanooga as we flew out, uh, made it to Chicago that night. Uh, the next day, uh, we went to the ACS headquarters on the top floor. Uh, they have this beautiful room here, uh, the uh, reagents room. Um, it's got a beautiful overview of the city uh, in the coastline, and this is where we had all of our uh, lectures. We're also able to go out and explore the city a little bit, see some of the, the iconic uh, features of Chicago, and to enjoy some of the uh, festiv festivities that Chicago has to offer. In terms of what we're going to talk about today, these are kind of the six or seven things that we felt were most important and helpful uh, in, in becoming a good teacher and a leader. So we'll go through residence as a coach, uh, giving feedback, different leadership styles, um, creating effective conferences, the cognitive apprenticeship model and education practice, questioning skills, and teaching in the operating room. So for this first portion, I'm going to uh, let Dr. Lloyd uh, talk. Thank you, and good morning. Uh, so our, our first lecture when we got there on um, Friday, a um, lady by the name of uh, Deb DeRosa um, gave us a talk on residents, thinking about residents being coaches. Uh, and one of my favorite coaches is uh, Don Shula. Uh, he was the, um, not sure how much everybody knows about Don Shula, but he was the uh, winningest coach in NFL history. Um, as a head coach, he had 347 wins. Uh, he coached for 33 seasons. He have went to the Super Bowl six times. He won the Super Bowl twice, and he's the only coach to ever have a 17-0 season. Um, and he was inducted into the NFL Hall of Fame in 1997. And what one of his uh, more well-known quotes is he says, I think what coaching is all about is taking players, analyzing their abilities, and putting them in a position where they can excel within the framework of the team being successful. And so she pointed out to us as residents, we need to draw parallels between the principles of coaching and adult learning. And then from there, um, 
we can uh, <clears throat> look at the implication for clinical teaching techniques and how to apply principles of adult learning, how adults learn uh, to everyday teachings, both in and outside of the operating room. So kind of in order for us, like what, what do we need to do as residents and, you know, to teach our medical students better? Uh, number one is to pose engaging case problems. So what, what is an engaging case problem? You actually have to tell a real story and you have to raise a thought provoking issue. Um, there needs to be some element of conflict uh, and it ha must demand a decision from your student. Um, you need to provide the student with basic patient info and then you need to expect them to justify the questions that not only they would ask the patient but they also have to be able to justify their answers to you, um, their teacher. And then you need to put the learner in the decision maker role. They have to be the ones making the decision. But it's also important to leak the information and the skills to the students prior knowledge and their skills. Uh, it's also very important to early on clarify your expectations and then discuss specific responsibilities of your learner. And then also as the teacher it's important to think aloud throughout the whole entire patient problem as well as your management. Explain your reasoning so that your learner can follow you. And it definitely goes without saying that people prefer more engaging and enthusiastic teachers. So another lecture that Tyler and I really liked uh, was uh, how to how do you give feedback? We all on a you know on a daily basis have to give feedback both on performance both to ourselves and to our learners. So what actually constitutes effective feedback? So as I said in the previous slide, stating your expectations very early on with your learners so that they uh, understand what their role is going to be um, moving forward. And then also inviting critique from your learner. What are, they, what, are their, what are their goals? What are they looking to get out of a, a specific situation? Um, being specific and very timely with your learners. And again, linking the feedback directly to their goals. And it's important to focus on, if there's an issue, focus on the behavior, not the individual themselves. Um, and a lot of times we can information overload because we don't know what our learners already know, so we have to be careful about that. And then it's a good idea to try and translate uh, your feedback into a constructive challenge. Give them the opportunity uh, to go forward and look something up and uh, come back and tell you about it. So uh, the next thing we talked about uh, were different leadership styles. Um, so uh, Dr. Rogers, uh, who led the course, presented us with different styles. Uh, you can look at the different options and pick which one you are. Um, but visionaries like to innovate. They like to experiment, take risks. Uh, the coaching style focuses on the professional development of different individuals. And then how can they their, improve their skill set and accomplish goals of a whole organization? Affiliative, uh, more nurturing of teamwork and connecting people. Democratic leaders uh, prefer the consensus and collective wisdom of a group of people. Uh, pace setting leaders are driven by results. They look for ways to be done faster, things for, to be done faster and better. And then commanding leaders uh, provide very clear directions. So we talk further about when, when do each of those styles of leadership, when do they work? When it, uh, what situations is it best for you to be a specific type of leader or rather a mold of each? So visionaries, uh, if you have a situation where substantial change is going to be required, a visionary leader is a good, good person to have in that situation. Um, if you have a subordinate that you want to improve the performance, maybe a coaching style of leadership is a good uh, role to take. If you're having issues with your team, um, maybe a more affiliative approach. Um, democratic, obviously uh, valuing the input of each individual in your team, uh, or if you yourself want consensus or buy-in for whatever decision you're trying to make. Um, again, pace setting if you're, looking for, if you're looking for results fast and you want high quality results. And uh, commanding leadership is uh, described as best in a crisis. So we talked about uh, in general, it's best to, you know, combine these different modes of leadership um, when you're trying to attack a particular situation. Uh, and this was my um, personal favorite lecture. 
and this was how do we create effective conferences as, as residents? Um, what what should a conference have? What um, what things should be a core part of your conferences? And I specifically wanted to focus on the basic science conference um, after listening to this lecture. So obviously the conference has to be relevant, um, and most importantly, it has to be interactive and you need to build on prior experiences. So the SCORE portal does this to some extent, but we need to make sure that we're building on previous lectures. Reinforcement um, makes, makes the information stick better. Uh, incorporate feedback, um, asking uh, questions to the room or polling the audience so that there is more of a communication. And it's important to maintain a supportive learning environment. People don't learn as well um, if they feel like they're being singled out or if they're being attacked. Um, so it, maintaining a supportive uh, learning environment has been shown to be more effective. And so the uh, lecturer presented us uh, with this um, chapter out of a textbook. It was called The Cognitive Apprenticeship Model in Educational Practice, and I had never heard of this. So I looked up uh, the, the textbook, and it came out of the Handbook of uh, Research uh, on Educational Communications and Technology. Uh, and basically, the Cognitive Apprenticeship Model um, describes a uh, scaffolding, if you will. Interactive learning requires an appropriate scaffolding, meaning you have to build from the bottom up. Uh, so this was written by Dr. Denon and Dr. Berner, and basically it's we have to provide a framework for which new knowledge can be processed and organized. And so they split that up into three major categories, the conceptual category, the procedural category, and the strategic category. And basically through, cons through interactive participation with your learners, uh, they can consolidate knowledge better. Um, and this, this uh, textbook in that chapter in particular has been uh, referenced over uh, 120 times in various um, other future uh, works in terms of education. So this was um, a good foundational text. <clears throat> and then uh, next was uh, how do we ask questions? So when we ask questions, is there actually a skill set to uh, how to ask a learner a question? Uh, so this is... This is Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, the Dr. Uh, Benjamin Bloom uh, was an educational psychologist, and he originally wrote the Bloom's taxonomy in the, the 1950s, 1956. Um, and it's been kind of reworked, and there's been uh, several reiterations. One was published in 2001. Um, but basically, you start at the bottom, right? So basic recall. So your learner has to be able to recall facts and basic concepts. So define things duplicate, memorize, repeat, state, a lot of the things that we did in our medical school education. Now building on that, that knowledge base, you can actually start to assess comprehension. So how well does your learner understand? Are they able to explain an idea or a concept and apply it to a different situation? Which is the uh, third pillar, which is application. Now that you've, you've given them data, they now remember something, they seem to understand it, can they apply it to a new situation? Can they execute, can they implement? And beyond that, now they're starting to analyze. They can draw connections among different ideas. And then the next pillar is to evaluate. So now they're actually making decisions and they're evaluating their decisions and whether or not they want, um, they support their decision. You, you as the teacher support their decision. Do you defend them? Is there anything that they can learn from making decisions? And then at the very top is synthesis, so actually creating new ideas. So now they're creating new, new uh, work. And so from here, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Kessner, and he'll talk about some teaching in the operating room. So this was by and far my favorite talk, uh, teaching in the operating room. I think everyone's heard uh, this quote, see one, do one, teach one. It's ubiquitous. You know, you hear it in the OR from the scrub techs. You hear it from the nurses on the floor. I've heard patients say it. Um, and... Mostly it can be attributed back to William Halstead. So Dr. Halstead um, in the early 1900s created one of the first uh, formal surgery uh, training programs in the United States. He had spent time in Germany and seen how they taught their uh, rising uh, physicians and surgeons and their emphasis on formal training and basic science and he brought that back to the United States and uh, in Harvard started the first training program. This training program uh, originally was uh, four to six years as a uh, I guess what we would call a resident. Um, those years were not 
necessarily sequential and that you were uh, promoted to the next year level when he felt that you were comfortable, when he felt he was comfortable with uh, promoting you to the next year level, and then two years as a house uh, surgeon uh, before leaving and practicing. Um, times have changed quite a bit since the 1900, the early 1900s uh, to today. Uh, the amount of uh, information and the uh, large number of surgeries that have developed in the in the next uh, decade or the next century uh, are, are almost overwhelming but this see one do and teach one has been the hallmark of surgical training this is what has taught some of the greatest surgeons that have come along um, this is what most of our attendings have been taught by um, and uh, to some extent, this is the same thing that we are taught now, uh, but things are changing, um, and that's what this, this lecture kind of talked about. So uh, we've had several lectures on expectations. Um, this lecture uh, was really in, in a broad stroke about expectations and training in the OR and setting expectations. So you've heard Dr. Giles give his expectations talk. Uh, Dr. Moore, uh, if you've scrubbed with him, has told you that uh, disappointment is the result of failed expectations and Dr. Kelly uh, has his own opinions on expectations which I'm sure you'll hear when you do your pediatric rotation. Um, so what I'd like to propose is go over uh, two models that they taught us and these are two models that go through expectations and uh, kind of formalize them so that uh, residents get a, uh, a more formal uh, training in the OR. In today's society, uh, there are a lot of differences. There's constraints on time, there's constraints on money. Um, all these new um, outcomes uh, from that they're recording uh, get, you know, get recorded and, and the surgeons uh, are graded on these and that affects the hospital's reimbursement and affects the surgeon's reimbursement. And so things are changing. It's no longer see one, do one, teach one. You know, it's see a hundred, do a hundred, teach a hundred. Um, so the first model that we'll go over is the uh, BID model, and the second model that we'll go over is the ZWISH model. Uh, so the BID model is fairly simple. It starts with a briefing, uh, then the interoperative teaching, and then a debriefing. So the briefing uh, is typically done at the scrub sink. Uh, Prior to Avagard, which takes 15 seconds, your scrub was five minutes, and you would be scrubbing there with the attending, um, and you'd either have awkward silence or you would talk about something, but this proposes that you talk about uh, the operation itself, and you establish objectives for both the teacher and the learner. Uh, the attending will uh, tell the uh, resident what he expects him to do in this case, and the resident will say what they expect to achieve uh, by scrubbing this case. Uh, this also sets a um, climate of, of trust and um, allows, allows both parties to go into the operation knowing uh, what the goals are and what the plan is uh, in order to, to carry it out. And the I in BID is interoperative teaching. Uh, this is where you go through the targeted uh, objectives. Um, I like to think that in this picture here, Dr. Arnold's uh, targeted objective is getting light in the hole uh, and teaching these two residents to do that. But, um, and this can be varied, you know, in a lap coli, the targeted objective for an intern resident would be to uh, define the steps of the operation and then to take the gallbladder off the gallbladder fossa. Um, in more advanced residents, it would be dissecting out uh, the critical structures. Um, and then in a chief, it would be uh, guiding a new resident or an intern or a mid-level resident through the operation. And then the debriefing, so asking the learner to self-assess, uh, self ask them how they think that they did, uh, whether they think they uh, established their goals, uh, what they were concerned about, what they had difficulty with, and then reviewing with them the, um, the procedure and what they need to work on and what they did well and plan on uh, next time. Uh, so if they did the um, dissection off the gallbladder fossa and they got into the gallbladder or got into the liver, uh, plan for next time would be to 
take more care and define the planes better um, to try to get it off the, the gallbladder fossa without getting into either structure. Uh, I really like this one. This is uh, the Zwisch scale. This is uh, Dr. Zwischenberger. He's the chair uh, Department of Surgery at University of Kentucky. He's a cardiothoracic surgeon. This is a scale that he developed uh, while he was uh, teaching cardiothoracic fellows in terms of uh, progressing their autonomy throughout their training. It's a four steps um, scale. So the first uh, step is show and tell, followed by active help, followed by passive help, uh, and then supervision only. And this is the original paper that he described these techniques in. And so we'll go through them just briefly. Uh, the show and tell stage is the early stage. This is uh, the attending doing all of the procedure uh, for the most part, but it's not just him or her doing the procedure. It's him or her dictating out loud everything that they do, which uh, can be very difficult if you've never done it before. Um, they also demonstrate the key steps in the anatomy. Uh, the resident's uh, role in this is to uh, act as an assistant and observe uh, these steps and to perform the opening and closure of the procedure with the help of the attending surgeon. Um, and these are uh, you know scales that would be told to the resident uh, or the fellow before even starting the case. Uh, you know so for a laparoscopic cholecystectomy uh, at the scrub sink, the attending would say, um, Dr. Lloyd, you are in show and tell phase of uh, this procedure. Uh, my goal is to uh, walk you through this procedure, dictating everything I do out loud, dictating how I'm doing the dissection. Uh, I'd like you to assist me with the uh, closure and or the uh, opening and the closure. Um, and, and that's the stage that you be in. As you progress through your training, you move to the smart help stage. Uh, so this uh, is where the surgeon shifts roles between a uh, surgeon and the first assist, uh, depending on uh, the complexity of the case. When first assisting, the uh, resident um, leads as the surgeon role. The attending helps to optimize the field and exposure uh, to best um, help the resident in uh, achieving their goals and coaches the resident on the next steps of the procedure. Uh, the resident will switch between surgeon and first assist. Uh, he will, he or she will need to demonstrate uh, increasing ability to perform key steps of the operation and to be knowledgeable about um, the components and the technical skills of the operation. Uh, the next step is what uh, he calls dumb help. Uh, so this is to follow the lead of the resident. The resident is allowed to make uh, some uh, mistakes or to struggle uh, as long as there's no uh, harm to the patient or uh, jeopardy of harming the patient. The attending will help uh, coach in uh, refining technical skills and uh, assisting the resident in learning uh, the critical transition point between issues. The last step is uh, no help. Uh, this is essentially where the attending is in the room but not scrubbed. Uh, they provide no unsolicited advice. They monitor progress and ensure patient safety. Uh, the resident performs the procedure um, with an experienced first assist uh, and recovers from most errors um, and recognizes when to ask for help. And this can be, uh, these stages or scales can be multiple throughout uh, the operation. Uh, for a uh, gallbladder, a cholecystectomy, you can have two different uh, residents at two different skill levels. Uh, Dr. Lloyd could be uh, at the no help or the dumb help stage with the intern being at the show and tell, at which point uh, Dr. Lloyd would uh, assist the intern or the student uh, in understanding the procedure and the technical aspects of the procedure. So this has been uh, studied fairly well um, and it has pretty good uh, feasibility and reliability and validity and validity um, throughout these studies. Uh, this one here they looked at over uh, 1500 operations that residents were graded on. Uh, they were assessed for their uh, Swiss scale and then this was compared to their um, to reviews of their operative uh, progress and they used two different scales to review their operative progress and what they found was that in all aspects uh, the Swiss scale uh, accurately um, 
predicted the residents' ability to uh, get through the case and to uh, perform at, at their given year level. So um, these are our references. Uh, we had a good time. We really enjoyed going there. It was an honor. Uh, we'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, <coughs> questions or comments? Uh, uh, yeah, Dr. Moore, Dr. Stanley, both. Good. Thank you. That was very good. I guess I would ask each of you one take-home message or concept that you got from this experience that you intend to try to apply to you directly, not to this whole group. Uh, I guess mine would be, and this was the overarching thing, a theme of the whole conference was uh, to set expectations that are reasonable um, and to communicate those expectations uh, both to uh, residents under me and uh, attendings and staff above me in terms of what I expect to gain from procedures and what I'd like to gain from procedures uh, in terms of uh, junior level residents, what I expect them to do on rotations, uh, make those clear early on, what I expect them to do and be able to do in the operating room. Um, and uh, I think that was the biggest take home point is, is that these expectations need to be communicated and they need to be clear. And there's different scales that you can, or different ways that you can, you can set these expectations. Uh, but no matter what what method you use to communicate those, they need to be communicated. Um, yeah, I, I agree with Tyler. Uh, one of the big take homes that I really liked from the conference was given that I had um, stepped into running the basic science conference was how to make that conference more effective. So really what I've tried to take away from the conference and talk to the Dr. George who gave that presentation was things that we could do to try and tweak that conference so that it was more effective, a uh, better conference, better for the junior residents to learn. And um, so that's, that's kind of one of the biggest things that I've taken away and tried to, I've been trying to implement this year moving forward. It seemed uh, like it was more geared towards teaching of junior residents or residents. Did you take home much as far as how you as residents will teach the, the medical students? Um, yeah, it was, um, the, the course itself is, is, uh, they kind of design it for about a, a fourth or a fifth year surgical resident with the idea being that this is geared towards your teaching of more junior level residents. However, they also propose specific situations where we would, you know, the interaction was between us and a medical student. There was actually an additional lecture on, uh, teaching in the ambulatory setting in a clinic setting. Um, and they showed us different videos with the resident teaching the student. So I think there's a lot of carryover between um, teaching more junior level residents and teaching, teaching the medical students. <coughs> I'd agree. They had, uh, you know, a lecture on teaching medical students and it was um, about setting uh, or about teaching to their year, year level and setting them up for success, you know, in the operating room, asking questions that are appropriate for their year level, allowing them to do uh, procedures uh, that are appropriate for their year, year level and make them feel involved uh, in the procedure. Things like making the skin incision um, or using the bovie to uh, go through between uh, Kelly clamps, uh, things that are, are, are helpful and, and useful in the procedure and also uh, have a low probability of causing any injury but make the student feel like they're they're doing uh, a big part of the procedure um, and asking them questions that are appropriate for their year level and not not overwhelming them with information they don't need to know uh, the different kinds of um, anastomosis for uh, pancreatic OJ uh, it's not necessarily appropriate for a third year med, med student on their first day in the operating room but knowing, you know, why we're doing a procedure and uh, the basic steps of, of the procedure in a broad sense uh, is more appropriate. I think to that end, the uh, students and I were talking about this yesterday, and when, they, when we come on surgery uh, as students, you know, we think of operating all the time when, in fact, the real objective for medical students, for the most part, is defining 
which disease states are appropriately treated and evaluated by surgeons and what is the role of surgery in treating them much more than it is the technical aspect of things. Uh, it's hard to get that across, and of course that's what their test is. I mean, I'm sure you guys all remember your shelf exam that, that emphasized that uh, more than it did what type of suture you used or anything like that. So I think, I think this course also, I, I thought that when, when I was there that there was a good bit of orientation to medical student teaching because it was, again, sort of a laboratory for you as a resident to test your skill in communication and, and defining uh, the, the goals for people uh, along the way. Uh, and, and I think it emphasized, too, the fact that, that once you make that transition from college to medical school, then you're going to be involved in lifelong learning uh, as a physician. And if you're not, then, you know, your practice is not going to be nearly as fulfilling uh, as it would have been otherwise. Uh, and uh, so I, th I thought it was particularly good at emphasizing all those things about it. A, a few particular points, I think we can't overemphasize the issue of communication and I'm as guilty as everybody else of not defining well what, uh, what we expect of people, in fact I'm probably more guilty than others. Um, and I think that's something to just continue to bring up. Students bring it up all the time, just tell me what I'm supposed to do, explain to me what I'm supposed to do when I meet with them and talk about our resident staff, which they're very complimentary of. But that's the one thing that comes back is, you know, what, what, how do we run this service? What am I expected to do? And I think that's particularly important now. Um, the, it, the, the, the Swiss scale has largely been adopted. I think the, the BID sounded really good, but it, it never really took off that well, as, as near as I can tell, uh, in most uh, educational settings. And the Swiss scale seems to be the one that's referenced much more now in terms of evaluating how people do, how, how residents do. Uh, some of you may have seen just in the last week or two weeks, uh, I'm not sure if it's the ACS uh, tabloid or if it's the general surgery tabloid, but there's another accounting uh, for uh, the fact that finishing residents in general surgery are not all ready to be general surgeons when they leave, which is very disappointing to our educational system to see that. And the Swiss scale was used as the, as the standard uh, for evaluating that. And, and this is something, of course, that Dr. Dr. Giles in particular has been way out in front on because the evaluation system involved faculty using an app uh, on their phones to evaluate, uh, to evaluate what was going on. Uh, but you may want to pick that article up and read it. It's a I, I want to try to find the original document myself and, and read it, but it's another disappointing example of at least nationally uh, what's happened to us in terms of education. Uh, I, I don't think it's as much the case here, but I think we also have some different approaches to things that like being six years and like uh, having a lot more autonomy and independence here as residents than most places do. Um, so I thought that uh, that was, I'm glad you brought that up. And I think if you think about that, we, we probably need to look more critically at, uh, at adopting it as a part of our faculty evaluations. Um, I think, you know, all of you have to listen to stories about uh, what way things were before. I'm glad Dr. Arnold is here because he might remember Ralph Bowers. I don't know if you would at VA hospital. You never, did you ever have any contact with him? Right at the end of his, uh, when you mentioned Halstead and the Halsteadian uh, training model, if you look back at the history of what happened at Hopkins, which is where he really, you know, where he was after he was at Harvard, um, and he established the training model that was used, it was basically the pyramid. And the pyramid got thrown out of surgical education uh, in the 70s for sure. Uh, and that was one of the that was one of the problems. For example, with this program when I came here, it was on probation uh, because a pyramid was here, and RC said that's not a good idea. But at Hopkins, you came and started as a resident, and you never knew exactly where you were uh, because uh, 
you might stay around seven, eight years, or you might stay around three or four, and then he'd say, you know, I believe you're going to have to go somewhere else, and, and that's what Halstead did. When we were in, when, when, when I was a medical student, the chief of surgery at the VA in Memphis, which was a freestanding independent program at the time, uh, it was headed by Ralph Bowers, and Ralph Bowers was a very hard-nosed, Germanic uh, uh, individual, good surgeon himself, but had a lot of uh, really rigid ideas about things. <clears throat> and the same thing was there. The residents at the VA at Memphis didn't ever know when they were going to finish. Uh, you kind of knew that you'd been there five years or six years, but he didn't necessarily tell you you were going to finish until about six months before the end of that year. And there were a few things that he felt particularly strongly about, and one of them was if you played golf. Now this, the, I, I know this sounds crazy, but it was his opinion that anybody who was stupid enough to hit a ball and then walk after it and hit it again and walk after it did not have sense enough to be a surgeon. And, and he literally had fired residents if he found out for sure that they had played golf. And so if these, the residents would talk about going to play golf and how they had to hide and be sure they went to Jackson, Tennessee or someplace to play so nobody would see them and potentially document that they'd been playing golf. But at any rate, those were, those were the kinds of organizations of surgical training that were that were pretty rigidly uh, adopted and, of course, went away, thank goodness. Uh, he was a really good surgeon, a brilliant man, but uh, it wasn't any fun to, uh, to be around him if you were a resident. Uh, and and for, on rounds sometimes he'd just say, you know, that's enough from you. Why don't you go on, take off the rest of the day. Well, I'll talk to you in a couple of days. I mean, it's very tough on resident. Phil Pedigo that Dr. Witherspoon would know uh, from the state chapter was one of the graduates of that program. So anyway, we've, we've evolved and we continue to evolve. We continue to look at better ways to do things, and I'm glad you guys went. And for those of you in the audience, uh, junior residents, talk to them about it because I want us to have somebody going to that meeting every year because uh, it reinforces what we're here for. Any other questions or comments from anybody? Great presentation, guys. Thank you very much for doing that.